And so I've been, stalk, I, I've been dealing with a season, uh, with a message series called God Hates. And I've been dealing with that because uh, we always preach about the physical sins. Example, we preach against the sins of fornication and adultery and homosexuality and um, what's the other ones? Uh, lie, I don't know, I would, uh, stealing and, and things like that. But we don't, we don't really deal with the heart of a person that we could literally be killing each other with each other's words. And that some of us literally walk. Today I'm going to really deal with the spirit of offense in just a few minutes. And I want to say this, and I, and I want to bring an education to the church, and it's going to lead me. And how many of you have heard of Jezebel in the Bible? All right, Jezebel in the Bible called herself a prophetess. And she would, she, she would get things right. Be very careful, be very careful that people in the name of Jesus don't disconnect you from Jesus. And, and, and this is how they disconnect you. You ready? By becoming your friend. And the spirit of Jezebel is very, very sneaky. And it doesn't have to be a woman, guys, okay? So everybody hears Jezebel and they think it's a woman. No, it's a spirit. <laughs> it's a spirit. It has no gender, okay? We can talk about no gender now. Now we can do that, right? Because it's a spirit. And the thing about the spirit of Jezebel is that it's a controlling, manipulative spirit that comes in the name of God to confuse the people of God, to destroy the people of God. And people will think they're doing the righteous thing not realizing that it's contrary to the word of God. And so we have to be very careful that when we are dealing with each other, we have to know the spirit in which we come to each other. Perfect example I can give you is Peter. And I always use up Peter because people always debate the Old Testament, but I can bring up the New Testament. And in the New Testament, the Bible says that Peter was going to Jesus. Jesus said, this temple is going to be destroyed. I'm leaving, so on and so forth. I'm going to be crucified. And Peter, with his good intentions, he says, nope, not me, not today. You're not going to do it. Was Peter wrong? No, he was not wrong in heart or intention. But he was wrong because he was trying to stop the will of God from being fulfilled. So Jesus looks at him with all of his good intentions, with all of his good words, and he says, get thee behind me, Satan. That's horrible. Jesus just looked at a guy that said all the right things, but with the wrong heart. So we have to be very careful. He may have had really good intentions, and his heart was like, no, but he knew that the will of God was for Jesus to get to the cross. And so we have to be very careful that what we do make sure it aligns itself with the word of God and not with our opinions. Like right now, I can go ahead, and Yanni's in front of me, so I can talk about Yanni, and if I can find people that agree with me, because like spirits attract, so I can find people that don't like Yanni, before you know it, we're trying to say how the Lord is not going to use her, and something is wrong with her, and really, we don't realize, it's not that something is wrong with her, it's that something in your spirit ain't right, and you're trying to reflect it on her. And so you have to be very careful with that because the spirit of Jezebel would do that. And the times and seasons that we are in, are you talking about somebody, Pastor? No, I'm talking about a spirit that is rampant in the churches. And we use the name of Jesus to excuse our gossip. We use the name of Jesus and say it's prayer, but really we're gossiping about one another, okay? And so you have to be very careful how we deal with this situation and how we deal with one another. Because if it's not based out of love, then my question to you is, then what is it based out of? I'm going to say that again. If it's not based out of love in which we're dealing with one another, then what is it based out of? Then if it's not love, it's got to be hate. We just don't like to talk about it. Right? So we're going to deal with some things. In the, if you can bring me down just a little bit, I feel like I'm really loud. Because I'm about to get loud in just a moment. I'm just being calm right now. <laughs> I'm going to get excited in just a minute. Uh, but if, if we're going to deal with the word of God, then let's deal with the word of God, even if we're working on stuff. Like, I know God is dealing with my heart with forgiveness. There's just certain people here and people around that I've got to forgive and probably got to forgive me too. But God is dealing with me. I have no problem saying it. I'm a work in progress. 
right? Because I hear, I hear the rumors, I hear the, I hear the people. See, the problem that you guys forget is you talk to somebody, you forget that person's talking to me too. I'm calling it out like it is. I know you, I see you, I'm watching you, I know who you are. What do you think I don't know? So now God is dealing with my heart. Because now I got to deal with a heart of what? So then we find a new statistic that the average person loses seven important people a year. Or no, uh, in a lifetime. Seven important relationships in a lifetime. Pastors lose seven important people in a year. Well, you lose in a lifetime, we lose in a year. Right? And so, we, we, so I have to constantly be guarding my heart from walking under a spirit of offense that if I'm not careful, I will bleed on the people instead of bless the people. Do you hear me? So if you're a minister, lay minister, teacher, whoever you are in leadership in the church, remember, you've got to constantly guard your heart. The Bible says, for out of it flow the issues of life or the sins of life. And so you've got to make sure you're constantly guarding your heart so that, yes, I got hurt. I'm dealing with it. Don't just take it. Be offended. Stay offended. And before you know it, you go from walking in offense to now bleeding offense to now walking in deception to now walking because now the Spirit of God can't flow because now the flow of the anointing is clogged up the flow of the anointing is messed up the flow of the anointing is now not healing but now what's coming out is your pain instead of so now you throw shade you see so now you throw shade. So you've got to make sure that your heart is pure and that you're constantly healing in a constant basis so that God can flow through you, so that God can. That's why when people say, how is it that God moves to you? Because I'm constantly healing. I never think that I have arrived. Why are you saying all this? Because it's going to get into the word. I'm in the word. Believe it or not, I'm in the word. And so we've got to make sure. So last week, I'd be, are you learning something so far? I, I, I just want to make sure that we're walking in this thing. Because, because the greatest backslider can be the altar person. If, if you're not careful, you can become the greatest backslider in your own church and not realize it. Because you're not saying, God, that which is in me, remove it. If it's not of you, remove it. I'm constantly on the table, and the potter is constantly molding me. And sometimes he's got to break me to make me again, and break me to make me again, and break me to make me again. Because I'm a constant work in progress. Where did you get that from? Philippians 1 and 6, it says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I'm a work in progress until Jesus comes back. Somebody praise God for that. So if I understand it, then now it means I got to constantly deal with my heart. I got to constantly deal with my mind. I got to constantly deal with my tongue. James and 1 John talk about how the tongue, though it may be small, it can literally cause a forest fire. Though something so small, it can destroy people. You will destroy yourself by what comes out of your mouth. You know how many times people throw shade on social media? I ain't got time to think if it's about me. You're really, you're really insecure if you think every time you see some on social media, it's about you. I, I, Erica, Erica posted something. I thought it was great. It's funny. And, and Erica, not, uh, Erica, not Shannon's sister, Erica, our translator. Yeah. She, she talked about um, manipulators. And, 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 and in there it said manipulators, and I'm paraphrasing, right, have, uh, um, uh, are usually the last ones to know, and, but the first ones to do, they don't realize they're manipulators. Right? And so I've learned this about manipulators. Sometimes manipulators just don't know they're manipulators. Some of us are manipulators and we don't realize it. And we walk in and we walk into manipulation many times because we walk in hurt. And that's a Jezebel spirit. Because it's out to control people. It's out to control people. And last week we began to speak. So I call this God hates 1.5. So if you're ready, I'm gonna tell you, write notes. Go back and get this stuff because I'm going to deal. Look at the person next to you. Tell them we got to grow up. Tell them we got to grow up. Your, tell them your praise is going to change. Your worship is going to change. Your love is going to increase. Come on, tell them your love is going to increase. Tell them stop gossiping. Stop lying. Stop manipulating. 
Stop confessing what is not of God to make yourself feel better. Woo! Come on, I told you, we're going in. We're, 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 <laughs> some of you ladies need to understand, no, he's not going to change. Some of you men need to understand, no, she's not going to change. You can confess it all you want, but they got to make a decision. Anyway, that's a whole other story. It, 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 just, it, just, it just is what it is. It just is what it is. So we started speaking on the topic of how God does not change. You, you heard it last week. And again, if you didn't hear last week's message, I, I urge you by the Spirit to please. We, we, we have to understand that we have to talk about and we explain what God hates is driven by what he loves. I told you I'm going to teach you. What God hates is driven by what he loves. God is not driven by opinion, but by his word that produces love. Please follow me because we're going to run in just a minute. But, but I want to get into this word. I could have done announcements, but I just want to get into this word because I need to teach you. Somebody say, teach me, Pastor. Say, I want to grow, Pastor. Let's go. Come on. Teachable spirits grow. The Bible says in Malachi 3, 6, I, the Lord, do not change. I, the Lord, do not change. James 1 and 17 says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. We talked about this last week. For those of you that, came, that didn't come last week, I'm, I'm just pretty much, I'm just kind of throwing you in real quick. Is that okay? For some of you, you already heard it, but for the rest of you, I'm just paraphrasing and summarizing what I speak, spoke last week, and I'm bringing, it, I'm bringing you current, okay? His truth doesn't change because we don't like what he has to say. His truth doesn't change. He does not change. He is what he says. Now, go with me because he is what he says, and he's driven by love, but remember, what God hates is driven by what he loves. Go with me, if you please, to Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19. And it says, these things, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are, that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. If you notice the last sentence, he says, and the person. He didn't say the thing. That's crazy. He says, I'm the one who sows discord, not the thing that sows discord. He didn't talk about a spirit being. He talked about a human being. Ooh, Jesus. We're going to get into that later on. So this is lined up, for those of you that are scholars or have taught Bible Institute and Bible Colleges, this is in line with our Lord Jesus Christ's uh, elaboration on the Ten Commandments during when he preached what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm not going to read it, so don't go scared. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through 48, Jesus is very clear. And he's bringing a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he's very much explaining. And these are the topics that you're going to find in the Sermon on the Mount. Number one, you're going to have anger and lust. You're going to have reasons for divorce, oaths or keeping your word, retaliation and loving your enemy. Somebody pray for me. I don't know about you, but it's hard to love your enemies, right? It's, it's really hard. It's really hard. It's really hard. Nerves that about, you know, Jesus, and that, that's the thing I don't understand about the new modern day Christian. The modern day Christian says, you know, I'm mad at you. I hate you. You hate me. We move on. We keep going. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you know that somebody's got a fence with you, or they, or you've got a fence with them, lay your gift at the altar. In other words, your praise, your worship means nothing until you go and try to make it right. If they don't want to make it right, then that's on them. If they don't want to make it right, that's on them. Now their spirit is messed up. They're messed up. God won't hear your prayer. God won't hear your supplication. God won't hear what you've got to say. You want to know why? Because you didn't want to make it right. The other person did, and then they back up. Okay, well, that's between you and God because I try to make it right. But you don't want to. But this is the thing. Don't come six months later trying to make it up. You missed an opportunity. There's an opportunity for healing. The other time, that's between you and the Lord. Because now the person moved on, and the person is healed, and the person keeps going. But if you don't want to walk in that, you want to walk in division, that's on you now. So healing is not hearing an apology. Healing, healing is admitting that it happened and moving on. I'm going to say that again. Healing is not hearing an apology. Hearing is accept, healing is accepting what happened and moving on. And then say, I release it from my life so it doesn't taint my heart. So now, Jesus was constantly seeking how sin is committed the moment it is in the, conceived in the heart of man. 
Even before it is actually committed. Everybody wants to talk about, yeah, but I didn't, I didn't commit the sin, but you committed it in your heart. That's where Jesus messes it all up. Because in the Old Testament, if I did it physically, I've sinned. Then Jesus comes in and said, it's not about doing it. It's about doing it. I didn't technically lie. I didn't, I didn't cheat on my wife, but you watched something you shouldn't have watched. I didn't, I didn't cheat on my husband, but you were flirting with a person you shouldn't have been flirting with. And so now Jesus is dealing with the heart of man because God was dealing with the heart of man on the things according to the things he hates. He's constantly dealing with the heart of humankind since Genesis in the beginning when he is dealing with Adam and Eve. He's been dealing with our hearts, intentions, and motives and desires. God is constantly dealing with you and with me, making sure that our praise stays pure, that our heart is pure, that our motives are pure, that what we do from here is pure, that what you do from there is pure, that when you serve is pure, that when you give is pure. It's like people that stop giving their child because they're mad at me. You're the one that cursed yourself. You didn't affect me. I'm not going to give my time. Oh, that's fine. Well, I'm going to give it to my apostle. That's not your pastor. It's where you get fed is where you're supposed to give your time. At the end of the day, it's an obedience to God, not an obedience to Pastor Danny. You're the one that cursed the ground you're walking on. I'm not cursing it, and I don't bless you. You get what I'm saying? We think that in the kingdom of God, we're going to act carnal and think that God's going to bless us with it. I'm not going to talk to you because I don't like you. Well, that's not how it works in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, I got to make it right with you. Now, if you don't want to make it right, that's up to you. See, how, see, now things are quiet, real quiet right here. God is constantly dealing with our hearts. Look at the person next to you. He's dealing with my heart. Come on, I know some of you don't like this teaching, but it's real. Come on. I'm not going to teach you something I've perfected either. I'm a, see, I'm just being honest. I can't be nothing but honest. I haven't perfected this yet. Some of you are going to get me mad. I'm going to get some of you mad. It just is what it is. We're human beings. We're going to deal with it. Look at the person next to you and say, you may get offended by the pastor. And tell them, and the pastor might get offended with you. <laughs> but we're going to grow together. <laughs> I just, listen, I don't stop being here. Listen, it's like my kids. You know, I, I told Layla and Isabel before we, before we adopted them, I said, you got one last chance. We're in this courtroom. You can say no right now if you don't want me to be your daddy. You got, it's up to you because they're at the age where now they make the decision. And they're like, no, no, no. I said, okay, because now you, excuse my language, but I said, but now you're screwed because now, <laughs> and I, <laughs> if you're a Figueroa, you're going to get the butt whooping. You'll get everybody, like everybody else. You ready? You know? And, and, and so I'm your pastor. You sure you want me to be your pastor? Okay, well, we're going to preach this. It's going to feel like medicine going down, but it's going to be healing. It's your fault. You chose me. All of us at one time or another have fallen into one of these. But the enemy of our souls doesn't want us to break or speak, excuse me, about it. Why? Because if we can stay divided, if we can stay angry, if we can stay bitter, then he can can conquer over our spirits and over our minds. Please, I need to teach you this before we run. Write this down. Division, whether in your house or in your church or at your job, division is a killer of vision. Division is a killer of vision. The reason there's some, in many places there's no joy in your home is because there's a division. I remember one time DJ and I, I share about our family. I'm not sharing all of our business, but DJ and I were going at it. You know why? He's a teenager. He's at that age. How many have teenagers or have had teenagers? So you know what I'm talking about. You know how you go at it, and it could be for a few months, not just a few days. It can go for a few months. So you, you guys that have babies, I give you no hope. So you <laughs> I remember when Jonathan was, Julie was just so tiny and such a baby. And I said, get ready, because she's going to manipulate. Nah, but nah, 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 nah. Remember that, Jonathan? Nah. Man, one day I see him, I was like, ah, what I tell you? He goes, yeah, PD, man. 
<laughs> so I give you no hope again. So you become, you become a teenager. And, and, and so we were going at it. And one day, the Spirit of God took a hold of my wife. And she looked at me and she looked at me and she goes, I don't know what's going on with you two. But this house will not be divided. And she took a, <laughs> she took a hold of that thing. Me and DJ weren't sure if she was going to whoop us both. <laughs> or what was going to happen. But somebody had to grab a hold of the atmosphere and say, in this house we walk with the vision of God. In this house we walk united. In this house the devil can't. In this house somebody got to do something. Because if somebody doesn't grab a hold of the atmosphere that's trying to divide your home, then the devil has free reign to divide your family. And now the fathers and the sons are divided. And now the house is divided and God won't get the glory. And if you ask me what it was about right now, I have no clue. Now, have you noticed you get mad at your kids? You forgot why you're mad, but you know you're mad. Uh-huh. So you just stay there. You just stay there. Don't ask me. I'm just mad. <laughs> that was my mother. Vete para allá. My mother used to say, Lárgate. She would emphasize that R. Lárgate. Sounds better in Spanish. It means leave. <laughs> See the difference? Lárgate. Leave. Big difference. There's just more passion in that Latin, you know? Someone once said, the least affected can be those who are the most offended. The least affected can be those who are the most offended. In other words, why? Because they make it personal and it has nothing to do with them. It has nothing to do with you. But you took it on because you wanted to be offended because that person you're offended with had already offended you once and now you're going to get on this train of offense because you want to stay there. That's called a decision. That's not a demonic attack. Some things get rebuked. Some things are decided. I'm going to say that again. Some things get rebuked, but other things get decided. A heart that desires offense is a heart that is far from God. How do you say that? Go, every, again, I'm giving you no opinion. If you notice, I give you scripture. Because I want to make sure we walk whole. I want to walk in peace. Have you noticed when you're offended with somebody, you're not walking in peace? Seriously. When you're offended with your spouse, are you walking in peace? When, when you're offended with your children, are you walking in peace? When you're offended with somebody at work, when you're offended with somebody in church, are you, really, are you really walking in peace? The answer is no. You're not walking in peace. Haven't you noticed when you're arguing with... I'm going to talk to the husbands. Haven't you noticed, husbands, when you're angry with your wife, you're thinking, oh, Lord. Because you met... Come on, let's be honest. And you're like, I got to go home, and I got to lay down with this woman, and I don't know what she's going to say today. Or she might not say anything. Why? Because there, So there's no peace. When there's peace, you're like, I'm going home. I'm going to see my wife. I'm going to see my kids. But when there is no peace, you're like, oh, and you stay in the car, keep talking to people. <laughs> it's my job. It's my job. I'm going to get in. I'll be there. Where have you been? I've been in the car. I'm just on a call. I'll, I'll deal with you. Because the kids are ticking you off and the spouse is making you mad. And you know what? I'd just rather be in the car. I'm homeless today. I'll be living in my car tonight. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11, it says, good sense, this is powerful, watch this. Good sense makes one slow to anger. Look at the person next to you, you need some good sense. <sighs> good sense makes one slow to anger, watch this, and it is his glory to overcome an offense. So according to the law of logic, that means that the opposite is also. It steals from the revealed glory of God when we harp on an offense. So the glory of God is revealed and poured out when we have the good sense to be slow to anger. 
But that means then, according to the law of logic, that the Spirit of God cannot move when we harp on the Spirit and walk in the Spirit of offense. Based upon Scripture. So God's glory is produced when we forgive offenses. Have conversations. Walk in what the Bible calls the ministry of reconciliation instead of walking in the ministry of grudges. Harping. Offense. And bitterness. When these things are manifesting and moving in our lives, it's like clogging the pipe of presence. The presence of God cannot flow when things are in the way so that God can do what he wants to do. The medicine of God hurts. The medicine of God is confrontational. God did not come to tell you how good you are. He came to tell you how good you are not, but how good he is. And that's why he came to this earth is because there's no good thing in us because of sin. We are apt to be good the same way we are apt to sin. Because it is in us to want to do good, but have no power in us to live in obedience unless we have the power of the Holy Ghost in us. But the problem with the believer is that if we don't learn how to unclog the spiritual toilet, then filth has no choice to overflow. You're right. To offense, listen to me please, is not taken from you, but relinquished when God's glory is the reason for moving in his kingdom. Yes, many of us have the right to be offended. Yes, you are right. They said something. They did something. They looked at you some way and it offends you. I get it. You have the right to be offended, not the right to stay offended. You have the right, you have the right to be hurt when someone hurts you. You have the right that if a word comes out that they say that you don't like, man, that offended me. Watch this. But you don't have the right to stay with it. Why? Because if Jesus comes right now, will you go with him? It is about salvation. It is about the glory of the Lord. It is about, yes, it is about your relationship with Jesus. Don't come to me talking about that we're going to praise God. But now, I, listen, I had a meeting one time. And I know they're probably watching me and I don't care. I had, a, I had a meeting one time. And this person literally told us, I can't praise with this person in the same church. And I looked at them. I said, then the only place where you're going to be able to praise is in hell. Because what are you going to do when you get to heaven? And you walk in through those pearly gates and God decides to put your mansion next to their mansion. What, what are you going to do? That's not, that's not how the kingdom of God works. This is not how this works. We don't just, I don't like this person, so I'm going to sit over there because I don't want to choose. I'm going to sit back there. I'm going to sit over here. I'm going to sit over here. I'm going to sit over there. As long as I'm far from them because they don't even come say hi to me. That is not the heart of God. That is the heart of the devil that wants to divide you and put you aside but still make you comfortable in the house of God in sin. You may not be fornicating, but you walk under a spirit of offense that's divisive. We don't want to talk about it because we'd rather talk about the physical sins. We'd rather talk about pornography and we'd rather talk about the spirit of the age. But the spirit of the church is rampant with people that say they love God but hate their neighbor. How do you know you love somebody when they've offended you and you can keep loving them? I heard a statement that said, I read a statement that said, forgiveness doesn't mean reconciliation. I agree. But just make sure that if it's not reconciliation, it's not reconciliation because of trust, not reconciliation because of bitterness. Because some things don't need to be reconciled. But you better make sure it's not because of bitterness. There's family members I'll probably never talk to again. Thank you, Jesus. Right? You know who I'm talking about in your family. You know how that's that family member. You're like, I don't, I don't want to talk to them again. The last time I saw them was at my mother's funeral, and I never want to see them again. 
Does it mean I hate them? No, I don't trust you. And, and, and if you have a party, I'll go. But guess what? I will not walk under a spirit of offense with them. Because I'll give you chance after chance after chance. But after, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I really feel this in my spirit. Some things you just got to let go. You don't got to have relationships with them again. Some people just don't have to have relationships again. But it does not mean that when you see them now, you got to be bitter. If when you see them, you're going to be bitter, that means your heart needs to be healed. If when you hear their name and you still jump, your heart has to be healed. Because now it's not a them thing, it's a you thing. Now the tables have turned. See how I went from, I have the right to be offended, but now I walk in unforgiveness. So that's why there's a fine line. Are you getting what I'm saying? Your heart is the question here. Pastor Charlene says, and I'm going to quote her. (laughs) Because it's warranted doesn't mean you have the biblical right to hold on to it. Because it's warranted. This whole thing about church offense, I'm over it. Pastors get offended by church folk too. It's always this way. I mean, not really here. You guys are awesome. I'm not going to lie. I, I, I don't even have a problem. No, for real. You guys are awesome. But I hear this a lot where people, I've had people come here. I'm offended with this church or that church. And they're always offended at a church. And I get it. You're going to get offended. My God, you're dealing with people. You don't say that about your job. So we need, to, we need to learn how to maneuver through the offenses where the devil doesn't get the glory, but God does. Listen to me again. We have to maneuver through the offenses where God gets the glory, not the devil. Because if we don't get God, give God the glory in our everyday life, who are we giving the glory to? It's just the law of logic. If you notice, that's what I'm throwing out there. Pastor, but I was hurt. Okay. Pastor, but they said, all right. No one's denying that. I have to harp on this a little bit because if we're not careful, if we're not careful, our salvation is at risk. Listen to me. Our salvation is at risk when we don't know how to forgive the ones we know and see. It's imperative to me. Some people don't like this message because you want to run. I'm not running today right now. I've got to deal with the heart of people. Listen to me. I still got some time. I want you to write this word. Write this down. Say his word is what leads his decisions. Write it down. His words. You've never seen me like this calm before, have you? His word is what leads his decisions. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And watch this. And is a discerner of the thoughts and... Woo! And the intents of the heart. The word of God is a discerner of the intents and the heart of you and of me. Okay? In other words, the word of God is a sword that has two edges cutting both ways. It cuts going in and it cuts coming out. The word of God cuts going in and the word of God cuts going out. In the Bible, for two edged the sword, the Greek word here means distomos. I want you to write that down. D-I-S-T-O. M-O-S, D-I-S-T-O-M-O-S. It means double mouth. It means two-edged, a double-edged. Sword with both sides of the blade sharpened figuratively what uh, penetrates at every point of contact coming in or going out. In In other words, the term word in this scripture is from the word rhema. The word rhema. So I'm going to say that again. The term word here is in the scripture is from the word rhema, not logos. Logos is written. Rhema is something that is spoken clearly. Rhema means something that is spoken clearly, vividly, in unmistakable terms, excuse me, in undeniable language. Understand that when God speaks, he speaks rhema. He speaks clearly. He doesn't speak just figuratively. He speaks clearly into your heart, into your mind, and into your spirit. God is very clear that when he says no, it's no. When he says yes, it's yes. When he says wait, 
its way. At the end of the day, God is speaking. And you, listen, whenever somebody talks about the Lord said, you better make sure he's clear. God is not confused. And if you're one that likes to give word, you better not give that word until you know it's a clear word, specific word. Don't just come out talking about, and I hear the Lord say, God's going to use you. That's great. Can you tell me how? Be specific with the word of God. It's important. It's important. Somebody say Rema. When God speaks, he's clear. So when the word is spoken and the two-edged sword definition also means double mouth, then this means it must be spoken back. So it's piercing going in and it cuts coming out. So that translation means that when I'm speaking, it's a double mouth sword. In other words, it, when God goes out and he's going to speak a word. So in other words, I, I, and I, I don't want to go ahead, go with me to Isaiah 55 and 11 where it says, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me void or empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose." And shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. You are the thing for which he sent it. In other words, when you hear God speak it, you must come into agreement with it and speak it back to receive the blessing from the fruit of your lips, which leads to the other side of the coin. If you speak the opposite of what he is speaking, it then produces a bitter fruit of things that God hates. So if we don't speak the word of God back to him and we don't speak the word of God back into his atmosphere, then we are not producing the fruit in which he intended of your lips that bring him praise and glory. If you begin to speak the opposite of what God is telling you to speak, then you begin to speak what God hates instead of speaking what God loves. We're going to change the way we speak. We got we to gotta change. We got to love what God loves and we got to hate what God hates. And now go with me to Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 again. What are the things that God hates? God is very clear. He says, these, these things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A, a, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. We dealt with the other ones but we're going to deal with a heart that devices wicked schemes what does this mean the uh, the this encompasses thinking or conceiving evil against an any individual or group of person or uh, for personal benefit for other watch this disguided objectives like modern day terrorists indulging in other words you are planning in your heart how you're going to hurt your fellow brother it's not just talking to the world he is talking to the people in the church that you don't fall into that trap that you're happy that you're happy when somebody falls in sin be very careful with that lest you fall and people rejoice when you fall because what you sow you're going to reap this is a heart that's contrary to God when you see a prophecy when you're like Lord you know why well God will show you the sin of somebody it is not for you to rejoice it's for you to say God have mercy on them God reveal your glory to them reveal your purpose to them it is not to conceive in your heart I can't wait to see the destruction of that church I can't wait to see the destruction of that job I can't wait the God that is not how God speaks in the New Testament in the New Testament, God speaks to the believer and he says, I need you to curse. I need you to bless those that curse you. I need you to love those that come against you. And that is how you know if you're truly saved in your heart. That is how you know if there's forgiveness in your heart. That is how you know if truly God is speaking to you. Any sin is basically a wicked scheme. David's sin against Uriah, the Hittite. And Bathsheba comes to mind. If you remember in 2 Samuel chapter 11, I'm not going to read it. It talks about how David saw Bathsheba and sees her high up on uh, on taking a bath on top of the house. And the Bible says that he schemed in his heart how he can get her husband to the front of lines so that he can get him killed. And some of us are in the same drought. And we're trying to, listen, listen, believer, listen, believer. The man of God that is married, the woman of God that is married is not your, listen to me. I am not going to be your husband. She is not going to be your wife. We is married. And God is never going to tell you that I'm going to be your husband. And I'm just using myself as an example. Ain't nobody ever come to me with that nonsense. No, that's a lie. We were engaged that one time. Remember that one chick? 
I did. I really did this. I was at Living Water Fellowship. I was a Pastor Terry had me as his youth pastor. And this one girl talked to me and she said, I heard you're engaged. I said, Yeah, I'm engaged. She's in the back. Charlene's in the back. And she said, Well, you know, if you ever need to talk and things don't go right, I said, Oh, the devil is a lie. Oh, you are a hoe. <laughs> right, Char? They went running to Pastor Shar in the back. I said, You are you a hoe. She's a hoe. Didn't I say that? Out loud in the middle of the floor. Pastor Terry looked at me, he goes, What are you doing? I said, she's a hoe. She just told me she wants, if I ever need to go to her because I'm having a problem with Charlene, I'm trying to get married to Charlene. The devil is a liar. That he said, well, and he walked away. <laughs> and the young people went running back to Pastor Charlene. They go, did you hear what Pastor Daddy just did? Listen, I don't play with that nonsense. And the problem in the body of Christ is we try to use the word of God to try to bring confusion. Spirit of Jezebel, you get what I'm saying? That's how the devil works. To try to bring destruction with kind words. That's why the Bible says he's likened unto a snake. The heart of an evil man continually, deliberately creates schemes to bring others to ruin, whether physically or spiritually. My wife don't play. Don't come for my family. You see that? See, people, people, some people have seen my wife. Other people haven't. She's quiet. She's the sweetest person, but mess with me or her kids. She's smirking right there. <laughs> the New York Bronx comes. Her R's disappear. The hood comes out a little bit. She gets a little thug. She puts Vaseline on her face, takes off her earrings. <laughs> I'm just kidding, babe. I know you. I'm just, just, just. In the spirit. In the spirit. <laughs> Woo, glory be to God. I'm going to be in my car today in meetings. <laughs> feet that are quick to rush into evil, those, who fe- those whose feet are quick to rush into evil display no resistance whatsoever to sin. Having many examples in the Bible and having, uh, uh, and having the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, all right, we are expected to be wise in this regard. I'm going to teach you something very quickly. When you're going good with God, you're not so easily tempted. But if you notice, when things aren't going good at home, you go back to what brings you peace. And more than likely, it's not the presence of God. Some of you is drugs, some of you is sex, some of you is pornography, some of you is, some of you is drinking. Some, all of us have a vice, as they call it. The Bible calls it a sin. Some of you go from relationship to relationship because every time things don't go the way you want it to go, you go back to the sin that brings you, that's called a spiritual addiction. Ephesians 4 and 30 says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Galatians 5 and 16 says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit. How do you know you're walking in the Spirit? When times are hard and you can keep pressing. How do you know you're walking in the Spirit? When the things you used to do, you don't do no more. They no longer gratify you. You How do you know? How do you know you're in the flesh when your desire is always to go back? Ephesians 5 and 5 verse 11, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or or who is covetous, that is an idolater, not idulterer, idolatry. In other words, self-seeking God, you make a God of yourself, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. Verse 11, Take no part in the unfruitful work of darkness, but instead expose them. He's not saying expose the person. He's saying expose the sin in your life. Go before God and say, God, every time something wrong goes in my life, I go back to that pornography. I go back to that past lover. I go back to that addiction. I go back to that mess. That is what God hates. And here in the New Testament in Ephesians, he's saying, now that you know what God hates, let the devil be damned and expose that spirit. 
spirit that is attacking you. I lost my job. So now I go into a depression and I start going back into my old ways that now bring division into my household. I lost my wife or I lost my husband or I lost a child. And you get into this place of depression where now the devil has your mind. I know I'm speaking to somebody. I may not be speaking to everybody, but I know I'm speaking to somebody. And you get into a place of depression and you get into a place of anxiety. And before you know it, you start going retracting back to back to back and saying, now, God, where are you? And God is right where you left him. You went back. That's why it's called backsliding. In the Garden of Eden, Eve had the first experience of temptation. She displayed no resistance to the serpent's temptation. Instead, as soon as the devil attracted her to the fruit, she saw, she saw, according to Genesis 3 and 6, she saw that the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye. Eve had sinned at that moment itself. Now contrast with this, with the attitude of Jesus when tired and hungry and 40 days and after 40 days and 40 nights, according to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, Jesus has a Garden of Eden experience, the same one that Eve had. Because now he comes out of the situation where he was fasting and now the devil has a conversation with him. And Jesus refuses to yield to the devil's tempting and killed the temptation in his mind without allowing it to grow into sin. The Bible says in James chapter 4 verse 7, he says, resist the devil. Watch this. And he will flee from you. It doesn't say you will flee from it. It says when you resist the devil, that means he's coming up against you. You push him back. He has no choice but to leave because he sees the strength of the spirit of God inside of you, which means it intimidates him. You intimidate him. If you understood that the only reason that you're under attack is because the devil is scared of you. So he brings devices to try to divide you and your family. Do you understand what I'm exposing in your life? That's why some of you fall asleep and some of you don't want to hear this because your spirit can't hear this. Because it's just too much because God is holding you accountable to change your atmosphere, men of God, to change your atmosphere, women of God. God is waiting for you to change from the inside out and stop bringing excuses to keep falling into the sin that instead of playing with, you need to expose it back to God and tell God, I keep falling into this mess because I'm not resisting. I'm playing with. Pastor, you preaching long today. I'm preaching long, heck yeah. Because I'm not going to give you a 30-minute message and get this all out. I told you I'm going to teach you today. False witness who pours out lies. That's the next one. False witness who pours out lies. This is similar to the sin of the lying tongue mentioned earlier by this form of lying is given special mention as it could send an innocent person to jail or even lead to him being stoned to death as happened to, uh, to Naboth thanks to the false witnesses in, uh, instigated by the wicked Jezebel according to 1 Kings chapter 21 verse 8 through 14. I'm not going to read it. The first time you hear against bearing false witness is in the ninth of the 10th commandments and the New Testament is equally condemning of it according to Galatians 3, 9 through 10. I want you to go there with me. It explains the reason for the continued prohibition against lying. Colossians 3, 9 through 10 says, do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator which is who Jesus Christ you have been taught that the old you can be accommodated and Jesus is saying the old us cannot be accommodated for the new thing that you want to do in God Are you learning something today? Yes. Is it a hard word yet? <laughs> Look at the person next to you and say, if you're part of my past, you don't have room in my future. Uh-huh. That hurts some people. Because there are people in your past 
that do not want you to get into your future. So they'll remind you of your past so that you will never accomplish your future. I love you too, Papa. <laughs> a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. Ooh, I'm finishing. A man who stirs up dissension among brothers. We are created by God to live in unity and love one another. Listen to me, believer. Believers are others and sisters since we have the one Father. I don't need the worship team today. Believers are brothers and sisters since we have one Father God and one Jesus Christ. In other words, you are my brother and my sister in the Lord. The church is also known as the body of Christ. Many situations, strife among brothers and even within the church seems unavoidable. Go with me to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. I'm finishing. That means you can start playing. Thank you. It says, whoever says in the light, listen to this. Whoever says in the light, it doesn't say in the darkness. Whoever says when they know about salvation. Whoever says, this is talking to the person that knows about Jesus. This is not talking, if you notice, the last six weeks I've been dealing with nothing but the heart of the body of Christ. John says, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. I don't care how much you praise God. I don't care how much you speak in tongues and run through this place. I don't care how good you can preach. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause, watch this, for stumbling. What causes stumbling when I don't love my brother? But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. In other words, you can be in the church and be blind. That's crazy. You can be in the presence of God. With light all around you. But because you're blind, you can't see it. Jesus pronounced a great blessing on peacemakers. If you remember the last thing, give me five more minutes and I'm done. The last thing about the things that God hates. Those that cause strife against the brethren. Isn't that what it says? It says, I want to make sure I read it correctly to you. In Galatians, in Proverbs, excuse me. And ones who sows discord or strife among the brethren. The Bible says God hates he. The one. It's called the law of first mentions. It's the first time you hear God say that he hates the person. See, the conversation starts like this. Pastor Charlene, I'm only calling you to tell you this. But I need you to pray for Brother Everton. He got me really mad. Because they're not saying pray for them. He's saying praying for Everton. And he got me really upset and I'm really offended by them. Pray for me too because I need to get that offense off. Great. Uh, Brother Jonathan, I haven't spoken to anybody yet. And you know that's a lie. They just spoke to Pastor Charlene. Nobody knows this, but I have a real big problem with Brother Everton. And I need you to pray because he did this, 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 and this. And now, we was cool, but now we're friends because now me and you, 
you don't like Everton. Watch this. That's how the devil works. You don't like Everton either. You're offended with Everton too. And now you guys are hanging out, you're chilling, you're going strong. Now all of us are hanging out. Then I, I, I called I call Yanni. I go, Yanni, you don't know this, but we've been having an issue with Everton. We've been having an issue with Everton. What am I doing? I'm causing strife. Yanni and Pastor Charlene never had an issue with Brother Everton. But I put a seed in the heart, and before you know it, now I've caused strife to come in to the house of God, and you're being used by the devil. Ooh, that's strong. See, some of you don't see it a big deal until I get into your marriage. It's like me coming into your marriage and saying, hey, Barbie, joy por ahí que, y que Henry hizo, and he did this and did that, and now I heard that you was doing, now mind you, ain't nobody give you no proof. Ain't nobody say nothing. What did they do? They brought strife into your home. They were used by the devil. You get it now? Ain't no difference from your house and the church of God. And, sa- and God said, that person I hate. Because they're of the father, the devil. Because their father is not me. And some of you must be like, oh, he must be talking about me. Mira si te cae el bayón. If it's on you, if it's stamped on you, and you know God, oh, he's throwing shit. I ain't throwing shade. It's happening. It's the body of Christ. I know some of you do it. I don't need discernment. It's the church. And the bigger the church gets, guess what's going to happen? You always going to have some. And you're going to have homosexuals and adulterers and fornicators and liars. You want to know why? Because you have all these human beings in here. And all of us are fighting different devils and demons. And all of us are fighting different sins. But at the end of the day, let's rip the band-aid off. Let's expose it. Let's deal with it. And let's grow into the goodness of God so that God can take us into the next glory. So when those devils come in, we can expose them, cast them out, and walk in unity. Proof Church, we got to walk in unity. We got to walk in the presence of the Lord. We got to walk in the glory of the Lord. I refuse to see things getting in the way of the flow of God because of our opinions, because of our feelings. You might as well stay on your feet. Matthew 5 and 9 said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Are you a peacemaker? You know what a peacemaker is? Come here. Let's talk. Come here. Come here. Let's talk. I love him. But if I don't like him, I'm not going to come to him and say, you know, I just don't like you. That's not a peacemaker. It feels good. But it's not a peacemaker. A peacemaker says, listen, Pastor Charlene right there just told me, come here. Because I'm going to be a peacemaker. She told me you had a problem with me. But Pastor Charlene's got to be willing to say, yeah, because she's a peacemaker. See, the devil doesn't want people to talk. I've had people literally say, Here's an email, and they leave, and we never have a conversation. That's demonic. That's not godly. You think that God's going to hear your prayers now? No. You think you sending me an email or sending me a text message, and I say, well, let's talk about it. You think that you're not going to talk about it, and God's going to get the glory? No, the devil got the glory. Has it happened to me? Yeah, it's happened to me here. But you're going to send me a text message, and then we're not going to have a conversation. It's like a husband sending you a text message. I'm mad at you. Okay, well, let's talk. I don't want to talk about it. We're going to heaven together. And we're not going to talk? Okay, so the devil's going to get the glory. You so ignorant. It is a spiritual warfare. And at this moment, we let it out on the table. And we talk and we deal with it. 
we got two options. Walk, walk away offended or agree to disagree. But still keep walking. Watch this. In the unity of Christ. Thank you. Galatians 5.15 says this. Next week I won't be as long. <laughs> I promise. Galatians 5.15 says, I want to read it with you. It says, but if you bite and devour one another, somebody say devour. It's powerful, right? It says, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Spirits are trying to hinder the move of God, not people. See that you don't devour one another. The word devour in the Greek there is to squander, waste, to ruin, to destroy, to put an end to the existence of something by damaging or attacking. Watch this, to murder. In other words, don't murder with your mouth. Some of us are murdering each other with our mouths. And I heard a preacher one time say there is more murderers in the church than there are in prison. And every single one of us at one time or another, watch this. You don't just got to make it right with God. You better make it right with the person if you're able to. Some people, you just can't. And that's okay. You move on with your life. But you're choosing to be let the enemy speak to you. And there are people in this room right now, listen to me, that the enemy doesn't want you to hear this message because you're so happy with the clique of friends that you got. And you're so happy with the life that you have right now. But all of you have one thing in common. You're divisive. Your anger towards one person. Your anger towards your spouse. I don't go to single men and single women to talk about my marriage. I don't go to nobody really to talk about my marriage unless we go to a counseling, period. Don't nobody need to be in my relationship. But I've learned one thing about this. I remember we were living in Georgia and a pastor calls me and he says, Pastor, are you okay? I said, yeah, how you doing? He goes, no, I want to make sure you're okay. I said, why? I said, I'm, I'm fine. Pastor Charlene's in the kitchen washing dishes. I'm on the couch. I just finished having surgery. He says, are you and, your pastor, are you and Pastor Charlene okay? I said, yeah, we're perfectly fine. I said, why? I said, why? He says, we heard that you guys are getting divorced. I said, speaker, babe, <laughs> did you hear that we're getting divorced? She said, who, us? Yeah, I have this pastor on the phone. This is what he's hearing. She goes, well, I know. Long story short. But now, mind you, those people will swear because the devil puts it in their mind, they said, the Lord said. And we were never further from that. We were so far. If anything, we were walking more unity that during that time than we've ever been before. And the devil will do that in your home and use fellow believers to try to destroy you, so-called believers. Don't let the devil in your home. You've got too much to lose. Listen to me, church. Some of you better start learning how to forgive and forgive other people quickly and start learning how to forgive yourself. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about salvations. It's about expanding the kingdom of God. It's about you doing what God called you to do. How do you know when someone's offended? When everything they do disconnects them from you or anything that has to do with you, but they want. This is the thing I've learned about me as a pastor. And you'll learn this about you. As long as you have what they want, they'll be around you, but they'll never invest into you. As long as you have a nice car, as long as you have nice things, but at the moment you don't have what they want from you, they'll leave you. You know what you do with that? 
you don't get offended. You say, God, thank you for showing me their hearts. God is showing you and exposing hearts. And some of you, your children are adults and they're doing that right now. And you say, God, thank you for showing me their hearts. I just felt that in my spirit right now. Thank you for showing me their hearts. God, deal with their hearts. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If God is speaking to you right now, just raise your hand. Because I know God will speak. Amen. Amen. God is speaking to you. Go ahead, raise your hands. God is speaking to you. God is speaking to you. God is speaking to you. Yep. God is speaking to you. Now be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. Right now. Now I want you to release forgiveness, not only for yourself, but repent to God for walking in offense. You give up. You and I give up our right to stay offended. I didn't say be offended. I said stay offended. We give up our right to stay offended. We give up our right to walk divisively. We give up our right to walk in the things that God hates. He hates them. 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 So why don't we do what God loves? Unity, peace, joy. Come on. That's how God does it. Walk talking to another. Walking in peace. It don't mean we got to eat chicken together. All it means is we got to pray for one another. Expect imperfection in one another. And walk in the peace of God. In the love of God. In the joy of God. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Not because it's seasonal. It's because I walk in it regardless of my feelings. You've come too far to walk in this nonsense. You've come too far to still hate your ex-husband, hate your ex-wife. You've come too far to hate your ex-pastor, hate your ex-youth pastor, hate your ex-boss, hate your ex-friends. You've come too far. May the healing of God. This word is confrontational. Because we have believers have to grow in Him. Let forgiveness reign. There's some that may never forgive you. There's some that may never forgive me. There's nothing I can do. That's between them and God. There's some that want to believe lies about you. There's some that want to believe lies about me. That's not up to you. That's not up to me. That's up to Him, them and God. There's some that are always going to talk about you. Guys, we live in this world called the earth and it's full of sin and you're going to feel it and people are going to backstab you and people are going to talk about you. All you got to do, get yourself back up and keep moving. There's nothing you can do about it. You were hurt. Yes, you were hurt. Some of you were not hurt. You want to be hurt. That's different. Some of you probably been rebuked and you want to walk in the fence instead of having a teachable spirit. Some of you ladies, listen to me. Your husband had to go ahead and tell you the truth because he wants you to stop what you're doing. He's not trying to offend you. Is that he's sick of it. And some of you men, the same thing with your wife. Told you what she had to tell you because she's sick of it. And we got to grow up together. Well, guess what? But some of you men are weak. And some of you ladies are weak. And you let the person just say and do whatever they want. The devil is a liar. Open up your mouth, stop it, and move forward in Jesus' name. You guys have come too far individually. The devil can't be in my home no more. I want to walk in what God loves. I want to have peace with God and with man. I'm going to say that again. I want to have peace with God and with man. And God, if it, right now in Jesus' name, what is it that needs to be removed? What is it that needs to be removed? What is it that needs to be removed? Remove it now, God, in Jesus' name. God, right now, in the name of Jesus. We, we have to walk in your peace. We have to walk in your unity. 
We have to walk in it because your word said so. And I need to be right before you, not just with man. I need to be right before you. If I got to walk alone in this thing just to be right with you, then so be it. But I will not allow my heart to walk in what's been tainted from the enemy. I won't, I won't do it. Let our hearts be healed. Let our hearts be healed. Let our hearts be healed from the lies of the enemy, not the person, the enemy. So that we can do what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name. Come on, if you're growing, somebody shout amen. Come on, shout amen. You've got a clap offering. Look at the person next to you say, we're growing up today. Tell them we're going to walk in love. We're not going to walk on what God hates. Tell them we're going to walk in love. I'm going to love my neighbor. Look at them, look at them, look at them. For real, look at them. Look at them and say, I know you're going to get me mad. I know I'm going to get you mad. But I love you. And there ain't nothing you can do about it. Ha ha. Te amo y no hay nada que tú puedas hacer. I love you. There ain't nothing you can do about it. Come on, somebody give God glory because he's good. <laughs>